why is there so much hatred against the Bible if it claims to be the perfect good book? What could the reasons possibly be? Are they legitimate? How can we understand them? Can we draw conclusions? Welcome to Something's Happening Here. We're going to talk about all of this today. I'm Steve Hicks. Welcome back, everybody. Today is Tuesday, if you're watching this live, and I'm so glad that you are here. Uh, I would guess that you're here because you subscribed, so good for you. And if not, then go get that done before we're done. But let's get right to it today. Uh, we are going, we're, we're talking about the Bible this week, the good book, and we're looking at some of the controversies uh, around it. I mean, certainly I believe the Bible is everything it claims to be. I have tested it. Um, I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, to borrow a phrase from the Bible. But obviously not everybody believes that. Not everybody feels the same way. And it is worthwhile to look at what the opposing viewpoint is and the rationale behind that viewpoint so that um, we all, we the believers, can be better armed with answers, right? If, if somebody comes to us with these ideas, we need to know what to say in response. Um, so that will strengthen our own faith. It will strengthen our understanding of what we're talking about and what we choose to believe. But hopefully if we do it correct and if we speak the things of God in a godly way, maybe just maybe by his grace, some of these people will begin to think differently. Um, if we start with the premise that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him, which is John 14, 6, if you need a reference, um, then clearly knowing Jesus is the most important thing that you can do. And the way that we get to know Jesus is primarily through the Bible. So let's look at this article for today. It's called, Some Reasons Why Humanists Reject the Bible. And um, just some commentary, there's more than just some reasons listed in this article. This article is extraordinarily long. It has like 70 different notations at the end of it. So we're not going to read the whole thing, but I will look at one section of it today in, these, in the contradictions section. And we're going to look at examples of Old Testament contradictions. I'm just going to read them one by one and answer them. And the reason to do this is, yes, to disarm those who are uh, criticizing the Bible. I, I do want to disarm those arguments. I don't think they're valid. But we, on the believing side, can benefit from this exercise as well, because by discounting the false, I hope it will better reveal the true. And we can all um, finish this podcast and the others throughout the week with a deeper and more honest understanding of the Bible. So let's get right to it. Examples of Old Testament contradictions. First one says, the contradictions start in the opening chapters of the Bible where inconsistent creation stories are told. Genesis chapter one says the first man and woman were made at the same time and after the animals. But Genesis chapter two gives a different order of creation, man, then the animals, and then woman. And so because of this reason, the author of this article or the people behind this article um, use that as a reason to discount the entire Bible. So my answer to that is uh, that they're just not speaking the truth. It is true. Genesis chapter 1 does in fact say that the first man and woman were made at the same time, or at least close, on the same day, and after the animals. And so let's just read that. Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 24. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, 
let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. Notice that let them. <laughs> so man is singular, but then it's them plural. Let them have um, dominion over every, uh, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. All of this happened on the sixth day. And so this article correctly describes Genesis 1. But then it claims that Genesis 2 um, changes the order of creation, man, then animals, then woman, and that's just not true. That's just not. Um, so we read about uh, the creation of the first man in chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nost nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Uh, and then from there, it doesn't say really anything about the creation of the animals, so to speak. Um, if we just back up to verse 4, right? It says, This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown. Um, and, and in that kind of like miasmic context, then man is formed in verse 7. Uh, we are told the Lord formed a garden and there were some trees in that garden and a river that came out from there. All this is just details, details, details. And then, down in verse 18. Um, and the Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So that is from where these humanists get the idea that Adam was first, the animals were second, and then later on Eve comes last. And that is true. Eve does come decidedly after Adam. But I read that from the Bible on purpose to show that it never says that God created the animals after Adam. In fact, specifically, the wording is, um, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air, and then brought them to Adam. So it, it, the language there is not pinpointing an order of things. It's just saying the truth. God formed the animals, and it was Adam's job to name them. And so I just don't, it's just not an accurate criticism to say that somehow God changed the order of things because it's not. I mean, the animals clearly came first. Um, and there is actually a linguistic reason why it appears this way in chapter two, um, because it, it's a concept called chias chiasm or chiastic structure, where um, there are kind of bookending ideas on the beginning and end of whatever you're looking at, and then something else in the middle. And that thing in the middle is the main point. And so what we're seeing in the language structure here is Adam's loneliness. <laughs> it starts off with God's proclamation that it's not good for man to be alone. Then this incident with the animals happens, and he realizes... Um, Verse 20, so Adam gave names to all cattle, the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And so um, that, that's the thing in the middle, right? Where he is looking around and finding no helper because it is not good for man to be alone. And then at the end of that, he gets his helper, right? So there's a whole linguistic reason it's, it's structured that way. And it's not has nothing to do with the order in which God did stuff. So I just discount this first humanist criticism. Next one, before we run out of time. This has taken longer than I thought. Um, let's go down to uh, contradictions are also seen in the biblical story of a worldwide flood. According to Genesis 6, 19 through 22, God ordered Noah to bring of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, into the ark. Nevertheless, chapter 7 
Verses 2 and 3 relates that the Lord ordered Noah to take into the ark the clean beasts and the birds by sevens, and only the unclean beasts by twos. This is not a contradiction, uh, unless you believe like the kind of child storybook version of that where every animal goes in in a pair of two. But it actually makes a lot of sense that he would require a greater number of the clean animals because they are the ones that would be available to be eaten after chapter 9 and also available for sacrifice. <laughs> you don't sacrifice unclean animals. And so you need a greater quantity of them because they'll be used more often. In Genesis 7, where, it's, where he orders some of them in by sevens, uh, you can understand that one of two ways. I'm not sure which way is the right one. The Bible is not really clear. But there could have been literally seven, so three pairs of two and then an extra male for sacrifice. Or it could just be seven pairs of two for a grand total of 14. And uh, really, either one of those understandings would fit with the language that we're given in the book, and neither one of them is contradictory the way that the humanists are claiming. Let's go for one more before we're done. Um, Genesis 8 verse 13 describes the earth as being dry on the first day of the first month. But Genesis 8 14 informs us that the earth was not dry until the 27th day of the second month. So let's read that, okay? Genesis chapter 8. This is in the context of the flood. Genesis chapter 8. And we're looking at verses 13 and 14. <clears throat> and it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and indeed the surface of the earth, of the ground, was dry. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. How do we understand that? Well, it's because, um, well, first of all, we're in the middle of a huge rainy storm system here in California. Um, parts of this county and the counties on either side of us have been flooded out by this huge mess. Today happens to be a dry day. There is no water coming out of the sky today. But if you go outside, uh, the ground is still wet. There are still puddles, it's still squishy, your shoes are still going to get muddy, right? So which is true? Did the earth dry up because there's no water coming out of the sky? Or did the earth not dry up because the ground is still muddy? That's the issue we're running into in Genesis chapter 8. Um, the earth had been flooded entirely. It doesn't just dry up overnight. And God is describing these various forms, these various stages of the drying process of course they didn't happen at the same time. So I'm going to have to leave it there just because of the constraints of time. We're going to pick this up again tomorrow and look at other so-called contradictions in the New Testament. But the point that we're trying to get here is that there are lots of objections in the world to the Bible. Most of them have no basis. <laughs> and that's what I'm really trying to show here. There are good answers to pretty much every single objection that can be made against the Bible. And of course, it's God's book. <laughs> of course. Um, I just thought, I'm going to talk to the producer and try to get you an image. Uh, I mentioned this literary structure um, earlier in chapter two. The entire flood story is written in that same structure. And so I just want to show it to you. It's so beautiful. I'll get it to the producer. We'll try to get it as part of this video. It is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And I'm going to have to pick it up tomorrow with there, just for time's sake. So thank you for tuning in. I'm Steve Hicks. Make sure you are subscribed, okay? Um, like the page, which will make you a follower of it if you're on Facebook. And uh, also change your notifications to be alerted when we publish. On YouTube, press the subscribe button and the notification bell. And on Talking Donkey International, bookmark the podcast page. And if you have a couple extra bucks and some time, we'd really appreciate your financial support of this ministry so we can keep talking to you in the future. 
May God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. And if you're subscribed, I will see you tomorrow. This is Steve Hicks and something's happening here.